So welcome to this evening together. And uh, I'm going to speak about what I have learned from community. And you know, and uh, speak about some of the basics, you know, of the community experience, but also about my personal journey. And uh, you know what I think what is the most important uh, quality of community is that it can really help us to metabolize our experience you know it's a kind of support system we can lean into uh, in order to be able to digest what we bring with us from the past and tend to project onto the present moment experience so the community offers us a framework, you know, from which, you know, from the basis of standing on that framework, we can start to turn towards our experience in a much uh, sub more supported way than if we do it on our own. And, you know, generally monastic settings over the centuries, that's the reason, you know, why monasteries have been um, appearing in, in human society because they give us a certain framework within which you know we can actually you know dissolve ourselves quote unquote or at least to dissolve some of the patterns and then sometimes you know there can be times when it's quite difficult uh, to operate when we lose orientation and then you know being part of a community is extremely helpful to be carried along and then in times you know when we are well you know we can carry others so it's 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 a give and take and um, ashrams also operate in it that way or retreats you know when we go to a retreat center it's just a maybe a 10 days or five days but nevertheless you know we are carried by the retreat framework by the schedule the cooking is done for us we don't need to make any decisions much or even not speaking and also there's a lot of support so that we can turn inside and and see you know how we are operating and even you know on a solo retreat we are still supported by many others we need to eat and there needs to be heating and all of the housing and so on so that it is impossible without support to really practice and another example would be a therapy session it's also you know through the support of another we are able to open and go deep inside so that support you know to lean in and to engage with a certain part of ourselves which might be scary to do it alone and you know because these are very ancient questions you know the world and life has always been yeah, dukkha anicca anatta that has always been there and you know the and our world has always been on fire with greed hatred and delusion so that's why these kind of uh, support systems they are very ancient and uh, it's nothing new and you know in particular you know we need to start with our own bodies because our own bodies are like animal bodies and they have animal like responses you know when they are under threat or when they perceive to be under threat often you know old patterns of uh, conditioning you know we can perceive that we are under threat in the present moment when actually it's just past experience you know which is locked into the body and into the mind which gets activated and then there's these uh, different ways of responding one is <coughs> fight the other one is flight and the third one is uh, freezing or fainting and then there's a fourth one which is caring you know to really care for ourselves and for our own responses and through that caring, you know, we are then also able to care for others. And in order to do that, you know, to help others, we need to first metabolize these uh, experiences for ourselves. 
which means you know to really embrace and honor and give a lot of kindness to this animal part of ourselves because if we can you know turn towards it it brings us to a place of change and transformation and without the support of others this is almost impossible you know as i said even if we are on a solar retreat let's say in a forest somewhere still need to eat so there still there needs to be some kind of a support system and uh, what also can be very helpful you know if we want to do this work to remember you know who was the first person in our lives who has embodied that for us you know that that courageous turning towards and that you know big mind or great equanimity which somebody can embody in their being which has given us for the first time this idea you know this is there's a path you know we can do this and you know thinking of those ancestors on on their shoulders we are standing now and from which we can learn to engage you know with our own inner experience and in my case that was Ajahn Buddha Dasa this was a Thai Chinese forest master from the south of Thailand he passed away in 1993 and I met him for the first time 1988 and stayed all together one and a half years in his monastery a forest monastery called Watsuan Mok about four hours north of the Malaysian border in Thailand and that they are having um, 10 day meditation retreats every 1st to the 10th of every month in English and these uh, programs are running since the mid 80s and uh, I have been there many many years ago and that was for me really opening the path and the presence, his presence was such a huge um, it was really like a transmission of possibility you know, I never forget when I saw him and also how the whole monastery was set up. It was a very unusual place, very artistic, and he had a, an art gallery which was used for teaching also. That was called the Spiritual Theater. And so, uh, such a, you know, magical uh, setting. It, it really deeply touched me and gave me this sense of, yes, you know, that's something I can also do and so that was for me this a, a deep experience of kinship with, with somebody I'd never seen before who was from a different culture who was like in his 80s already at that time but still there was this very deep sense of kinship and because of that you know there was the courage it, it just like um, woke up a courage in myself i didn't even know that i had so that's you know that's a very good example of what community can do for us it, it can uh, help us to find qualities in ourselves which we didn't even know that we had them so that's a kind of impetus which can which can just like open up you know the next chapter of our lives and in my case it was like that with Ajahn Buddha Dasa and uh, you know that sense of kinship gives us the consistency to to move forward even you know it sometimes might be very very difficult and you know to find like a setting where we can express our deepest truth and can live from that truth and uh, for example, you know, this Zoom meeting here is such a space as well. You know, this is an action which moves us towards a greater kinship, you know, where we meet with people who are on the similar wavelength than we are and interested, you know, in the same teachings and, you know, willing to put aside some time for it. And then you know, my teacher Ajahn Buddha Dasa at that time, he was, as I already said, in his mid-80s, so he was old. And he got 
ill and it was clear you know it wouldn't live much longer so then i knew you know if i want to continue to walk on this path i would like to be in a community of people you know who, who are closer to my own cultural uh, background and i felt like in thailand staying there i would always be somehow on the edge of the community because i'm I'm a Westerner and, you know, don't speak the, speak the language only a little bit. So it was important to, to come into a space, you know, where I would be actually more challenged and more met also like on a cultural uh, conditioning level. So I was like thinking, could I go? And then through a so-called coincidence, which probably wasn't one, you know, I found the chanting book of Amaravati Buddhist Monastery in a meditation hall there in Suan Mok in that monastery. And I've looked at the book and I said, okay, I just go there. And then I went there and arrived there in uh, 1992 at Amaravati Buddhist Monastery, which you all have heard about, I suppose, because you're mostly in the UK. And uh, so that was a international community and had its own uh, order for women, the Siladara order, which was a very progressive step at that t time, you know, when bhikkhuni ordination was still thought to not be possible in the Theravada tradition. And, you know, there was a huge library with information from all kinds of philosophy and religions all around the world, which was amazing to have that access. And there was also a real openness towards psychological work. There was a lot of support there. And the main teacher, Achin Sumedo, was a non-Asian teacher who basically translated the teaching. You know, he has been training in Thailand for a long time, translated that whole program, you could say, the teaching and the, the community practice, which he learned from Achin Cha. So everything was translated for Westerners. And it was a very generous place, you know, where there were a lot of support. It was a great, uh, huge step, you know, into that direction again. And having so many role models because there were senior nuns there. So that was a very big opening. And I got training there and uh, a lot of healing also, you know, through the big community, I could really lean into, I could develop the courage to look at things in myself it wouldn't have been possible to do that on my own so so that was a great um you know um upgrade you know from coming out of of that monastery in thailand where i was a little bit more isolated actually because i, I was a westerner amongst lots of thais and it was an interesting way to live like this because I've been trained as a cultural anthropologist, but it needed a bit more um, holding and a little bit more connection, you know, real hard connection with people from my own culture. And that's what happened in Amaravati. And uh, so that was 1992. So there was another level, you know, of community experience, which went more into the depths. And then uh, about 10 years later, I met my first uh, Vajrayana teacher, uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And my teacher is uh, from Nepal, a Tibetan Rinpoche. And through a teaching which I attended in Austria, of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, this uh, Rinpoche was there. And uh, so we, we kind of, uh, there was also like this sense of, uh, you know, a certain recognition of kinship. And that again, you know, was again a, a new level of depth and of opening. And there were like certain elements, you know, which at that time I really didn't, uh, couldn't find that in a Theravada tradition, like a certain openness, you know, to the arts and a certain dynamism and uh, sense of uh, 
working you know with uh, the mystery which I couldn't really find at the Theravada at that point so that symbolism and art was very nourishing for me because I had also been uh, working as an artist before I became a nun and sometimes you know Theravada tradition was a little bit too dry for me in that regard so that again was like a big opening and uh, there was like a deepening and an opening and a sense of uh, letting go into the flow more and uh, at that time you know, I also became aware that the situation, the training situation for the women in Amaravati and Chittas was limited on a certain level because they didn't want to offer uh, bhikkhuni ordination for the nuns and it was expected you know that the nuns would perpetually stay in a novice kind of a position in relationship to the monks and that really after about 10 years or so that started to become problematic and I felt like I don't want to support that any longer and so and through you know through the invitation of the Sanaloka Foundation Ayananda Bodhi my colleague Nan from Amravati and myself we got invited to come here and uh, you know try to start a vihara for nuns and that's what we did and then uh, you know when we arrived here again we met we met people who were here bikuni sangha was already established uh, rudimentarily here in california and aya tataloka for example she is the one of the senior bikunis here in california so there were already some bikunis here and a small community and we saw you know how they were really using you know the bhikkhuni form which was given by the buddha over 2600 years ago and we felt like we wanted to uh, support that we didn't want to uh, stay in the, this hybrid ordination form which was created in amaravati and Chitta. so we decided to leave that lineage and take bhikkhuni ordination and then we, we so to say we became part of the bhikkhuni community here in california and the sana loka foundation with its board members and then also some of the teachers here in um, california in america were very supportive Werner Bhikkhu Bodhi, jack cornfield Werner manaleo and others who really helped us and supported us and Jack Cornfield invited us you know to use spirit rock to use the meditation hall there for our bikuni ordination for example so that really gave us an opportunity to bring the whole question of the bikuni ordination more into the mainstream so we had like I don't know how many but like two to three hundred people came you know to um, witness our ordination and we had uh, monks and nuns from all three big schools of Buddhism, Vajrayana, Mahayana and Theravada. And it was a very wonderful um, ordination ceremony. And Ajahn Pramali, whom you have heard from him, maybe he was there and Ajahn uh, Analeo was there. When Tupten Chodron was there and uh, when Blanche Hartmann. So there were lots of teachers were there and it was felt very uh, you know very special really it felt again you know opening up a next chapter and you know without community any of that would not be possible we could have never done that on our own and uh, and also what became you know apparent to me at that time when we came from the UK to America I developed more and more awareness of the ecological crisis and uh, because you know also having the freedom to embody more really my own approach how I wanted to live the bikuni life I got more and more interested in the whole ecological movement and you know went to 
quite a few of the climate uh, strikes was at the very first you know huge climate strike 2014 in new york which was like a great experience there were lots of uh, monastics there as well uh, when Bhikkhu Bodhi was there also and you know and start to experience a much deeper intimacy with with the planet itself you know as the largest community really and and start to understand you know that i as a human being i am part of this planet and i'm born at a particular time in history where the planet really needs help because things are, are not going well and you know and also through the meditation for example the meditation on the elements which shows us so clearly you know that we are not separate from the planet there's a constant exchange happening through eating drinking breathing and we never really cut the umbilical cord towards the planet it's always happening there's a constant exchange happening all the time and you know we are borrowing this body actually only from the planet it's like a riding animal for consciousness we borrow for a certain amount of time and when the time comes to give it back if we had a good practice then there will be the capacity you know to give it back gracefully so you know to really understand in the biggest sense you know the biggest community we are benefiting from are all of the beings you know which make up this planet and that we literally stand on the planet standing on the shoulders of it and and that for me you know made it so clear that uh, the concept of dependent origination or Paticca Samubhada or how the Venom Thikhnathan calls it interbeing so and that really helped me to see these implications much clearer and to feel a real strong sense of you know wanting to embody that and wanting to engage in that way as a as a bikuni and uh, you know seeing that the you know the let's say the theravada concept of anatta and mahayana concept of emptiness and the system theory concept of the ecological self they are all interdependent they are all the same way you know of looking at things and that this is a context you know which can liberate us really and we don't need to uh, turn away from what's happening out there in our lives but if we are seeing it in the right context then this very work you know is liberating also it's not just a distraction from practice and that became you know really clear to me at that time when i came over here to america and you know that the reciprocity of you know which is at the heart of life really which is very clearly expressed in buddhism in system theory and also in in all indigenous worldviews you know where it's very clear we are not separate and because we are not separate you know we have a duty towards the bigger context which in which you know in which we are operating from which we are benefiting and if we are benefiting we also need to serve it so it's the same like a monastic community you know when i am not well i be carried from the by the community and when i'm well i help to carry the community and that's like a constant give and take and if somebody only takes and doesn't give they will be kind of expelled you know from that system in some way or another and i think that's really important for us you know as human beings now in this world time of ecological crisis you know if we are not if we are only taking and not giving which is going to be expelled from that system which means that uh, we're going to die out really and that's just like uh, you know 
maybe a radical way of uh, applying the teachings but I feel like it's it's uh, very it, it just fits very well with reality and uh, So we, you know, we can act on the behalf of the earth community really. And in this acting on behalf, you know, we can develop wisdom and compassion and understand, you know, they are not separate from, you know, really fully acknowledging the huge community of so many beings we are constantly benefiting from every moment. And you know, Ajahn Chah, who was the teacher of Ajahn Sumedho and the founder of that lineage, he always, you know, was speaking about the practice is really, really very transportable. And in the suttas also we find, you know, in the Satipatthana Sutta, for example, you know, mindfulness internally and mindfulness externally, right in front of us. Both, you know, both applications of mindfulness are important. At the beginning we start inside, but then, you know, when we have one a little bit ground to stand on, it's also important to look outside. And meet, you know, whatever is happening outside from that, that refuge in, in awareness, in, uh, well, refuge in Buddha, we can call it that, that as well. And then really, you know, applying the medicine, the medicine of the, the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. And, you know, the scriptures are like an anchor for us so we can find our own expression of how we want to live the teachings. You know? And in that way, then we get, you know, we get kind of in a very rather mysterious way, we get pulled you know towards certain communities and certain individuals where there's this kind of a kinship there and in my life I must say that has really happened without me um, controlling it at all you know so that when I look back on that that gives me a great sense of uh, faith you know into the Dhamma itself that the Dhamma is really leading us onwards if we leave you know from that place there's a real like a call and response this reciprocity you know in the in the heart of life which is responding you know to us and to our especially if we have a real clear intention and uh, so when i you know spoke about that we are now, you know, reconsidering about our place here because of the fires and so on, not knowing, you know, does it make much sense to to continue with building out this place here because we don't know, you know, how the fire situation will develop. So I've made a decision that I want to go back again now to a more urban area north of San Francisco and I would like to develop a a small urban center which is uh, dedicated to the intersection between uh, the ecological crisis and Buddhist practice and I want to call it uh, I'm living at the moment at Aloka Vihara forest monastery and I'd like to call it Aloka earth room and that harkens back you know to this uh, art gallery I saw in the monastery of my first teacher Ajahn Buddha Dasa the spiritual theater so it's going to be something smaller than that, but it's going to be, you know, based on the same uh, approach of using art also as a way to um, inspire the mind and also as a way of uh, accessing, you know, different uh, layers of the heart mind, which which is not so caught, you know, in, in dualism. 
bypassing the dualistic mind and, and going more straight to the heart and art is a means of communication which can do that I feel and uh, you know having a, a supportive place where we can acknowledge our vulnerability in this very difficult time and from that acknowledging of our own vulnerability where we are you know as a species as a person as a community a great strength can come out of that acknowledging i think and that you know takes me back again to the reason why there are monasteries yeah so that people have the support to acknowledge certain things about ourselves which if we can really open up to that a great strength can be freed up you know which is hidden under the burden of of the, the unease you know which hasn't been really clearly accepted i think so and in that sense you know the path appears in front of us as we are walking it and uh, community is one of the three refuges and you know the buddha made it into one of the three refuges because it's so fundamentally important for practice you know refuge in buddha our capacity for awareness for awakening or also you know refuge in the historical buddha as our teacher the second one refuge in dharma dharma as the teaching and also the laws of nature and then refuge in community refuge in sangha and these three refuges they are you know giving us the framework for you know walking in the right direction it's like a gps you know which helps us when we are confused when we don't know where we are but at least you know we have we have like a compass going in the right direction and uh, not necessarily optimistic but happy you know because we are knowing we're doing the best we can do and i think that's what the you know the practice can offer us and that what community can help us you know to realize for ourselves and you know bringing us back to that questions what do you want to give your life for you know what's your real intention when you're coming to a meeting like that when you're practicing meditation to at the beginning of the session always coming back to that question that can really help us to inspire the practice and community can give us that that support you know to trust that we can do this So I think you know that was my little talk. And uh, if you'd like to, you know, stretch your legs a little bit or maybe have a little bathroom break or anything like that, then that would be the time. And then in the three minutes or so, we can have a guided meditation. gonna ring the bell in about two minutes
so i'd like to guide us in a in a meditation which is called rejoicing in community and i've learned that from Venor Bhikkhu Bodhi and i thought it was really very good and so i thought i'm i'm gonna bring it because it fits also very well with the theme of the day and it consists of two parts the first one is rejoicing in the merits and virtues of others this is mutita really and the second part is sharing our own merit with others and we are starting from the highest level you know from the Buddha and then we go down 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 and and afterwards we we share the merit so find a posture you can sustain for like about 30 minutes or so 25 30 minutes And, you know, visualize the Buddha under the Bodhi tree when he, you know, awoke, fully awoke. And then he would, you know, walk and teach for 45 years. So rejoicing in that uh, great uh, merit and great virtue of Gautama Buddha. who is also our teacher. There's a whole lineage of uh, teachers who have brought this teaching to us today. But it still operates. Such great merit he had. And then there is countless world systems out there. Some 240 billion galaxies are known. So there must be more Buddhas out there. Just allow that thought to arise in the mind. And then the Bodhisattvas, Maitreya and others, Manchushri, Samantabhadra, Kshirtigaba, the Taras, Vajrayogini, Kuan Yin, each of them have a special power which they contributing and rejoicing in the merit of those beings, those bodhisattvas. And then the great disciples of the Buddha his chief disciples, the monastic chief disciples, Upalavana and Kema Bhikkhuni, and Mahamogalana and Shariputta Bhikkhu, and also the great lay disciples of the Buddha, Anatabindika and Visaka, and rejoicing in the merit of those uh, great disciples. Ananda also, who was the Buddha's attendant and cousin. And then 
all of the founders of the different Buddhist schools and lineages, the ancestors, right down to today. And our own personal teachers, they are virtues which we personally, you know, might be able to recall or remember. What really touched you when you met them, about them? And then our fellow practitioners, our sanghas or our uh, Anukampas online sangha, for example, or my community here at Aloka Vihara. So fill your minds with joy and light and admiration for the great merit of all of those beings, starting with the Buddha, and coming, you know, to our meeting today, our community. And then all people in the world who work for the welfare of others, which are actually most people, even some are really misguided and confused. So for example, you know, Doctors Without Borders, the World Food Program, Buddhist Global Relief of Bhikkhu Bodhi, journalists who expose the truth in ways in which are very dangerous to them. And then for example, all of the trees and plants and algae, which transform CO2 into oxygen. all of the pollinators, all of the service, animal companions, the rivers, the glaciers, the clouds, all beings work for the welfare of others. And that's you know, particularly clear in an indigenous worldview to which we are advised, you know, really to open up to that wisdom and to rejoice in that wisdom. All goodness of all in the world, even the slightest goodness, you know, allowing the mind to be filled with joy and delight and admiration for that. So a certain buoyancy that brings a certain buoyancy to the mind and openness. And you know, gets the mind ready for sharing that joy and sharing that marriage with others. And first, then you know, we can share it with the devas, the you know, the deities or angels which act as protectors for the human world. And our job is to share merit with them and also the joy you know, which we have experienced by reflecting on the merit of others. So sharing that with the devas,
you know, and, and employing them protect you the human world and the Dhamma and good people so that we might be able to deal with this ecological crisis you know which has been set into motion because of our ignorance so that we might be able you know, to use this as a learning opportunity And then also sharing <coughs> with the Nagas and the, the dragon spirits. They, you know, traditionally it said they have influence on the weather and on the climate. And inviting those Nagas and dragon spirits to rejoice in our merit. To ensure benign weather climate so that human culture can flourish not perish and then all other beings in need of merit visible or invisible beings you know inviting them to rejoice in our merit May all obstacles be removed. And if you have anyone in your lives, you know, you can uh, now visualize them or a situation and share the merit. All uh, people involved in the crisis in the Ukraine And then just, you know, letting go of all uh, formulations of all concepts and just, uh, you know, becoming aware of the spaciousness of the mind and the space which doesn't end at the walls of this room. But this is like, uh, you know, if the mind rejoices, it doesn't want anything, it doesn't need anything, it feels enriched. And then it just opens because it doesn't need to grasp or contract around anything. There's a temporary liberation of the mind. There's a subtle joy there. Maybe you can taste that joy the buoyancy, the sense of enrichment. And just sitting with that spaciousness into silence
So really noticing and all the beneficial mind state which comes through rejoicing and joy. Joy is one of the seven factors of awakening. If the mind you know wanders off into thinking about something, contracting about something or around something, just you know gently bring it back to either the silence and the spaciousness or you know bringing up one of those uh, contemplations I was uh, talking us through, rejoicing in the merit of others. And so that, you know, really taking in the fact, you know, that there is a community we are part of, which is a long chain of transmission which started over you know, about 2,600 years ago.
And then for the last few minutes of the meditation, just coming back to the body again. Maybe taking a deep breath. So now we have like another almost 20 minutes, you know, if you, if there's any comments or clarifications or maybe questions anyone might have. And yes. Kelly is gonna unmute, unmute you if uh, you lift your hand, I suppose, right Kelly? Yes, you can either raise your hand with a little button at the bottom of your screen um, or you can just wave at me and I'll keep an eye on the screen and see if I can see you. I will ask Minori to unmute. I put um, one question on how to be um, involved in um, world issues like climate change without getting anxious and agitated and then kind of contradicting, you know, you know, not getting the practice improved. So like when you look at all these things happening, sometimes all the news you get agitated, you get annoyed what, it, what the other people are doing. How, how do you advise on how to do it without getting anxious? I think it's not possible to do it without getting anxious, but it's more like, you know, allowing, allowing, uh, you know, those feelings and really, but meeting them, you know, from a sense of, uh, 
the teaching, you know, the Four Noble Truths, for example, or with awareness, you know, that yes, there's an aversion, you know, because I only want to look at something if I know how to solve it, you know. So that's that's really the practice, you know, and this is why it's it's not like contradictory to practice, but it's a, it's a very powerful practice because it teaches us, you know, how we can uh, stay conscious with very difficult emotions. And, and because it is difficult, we need community, you know, to do that alone, that might not work, you know. So, you know, to, to, to look for the right communities, uh, which can help us or reading also listening to talks, you know, which can help us, uh, because as I said, you know, we don't need to necessarily be optimistic that we can, you know, do away with all of this. It might not be possible, but if you're feeling, I feel, you know, for me at least, if I know I do the right thing inside of all of this, that still gives a sense of uplift because you know, whatever happens, if there's a climate crisis or not, we all need to die at one point. So it's not like that, you know, it's not, it's not like that we are not going to get old, sick and die at one point. So the teaching already covers all of this, you know, but it's more, um, you know, seeing that the, the clinging and the craving for things to be different than from what they are, and this that very clinging and craving, you know, which doesn't want the climate crisis to be here, it's the same clinging and craving which got us into it, you know, because of the clinging and craving of wanting more, consuming more, having more, you know. It's always the clinging and craving, you know, which is creating all of this stuff so to just see that you know in the moment and and knowing you know that you're not alone with this but bringing some kindness to it you know does that answer your question manori yeah it's always the same thing right it's always the same but it's not easy that's why we need a community yeah I will ask Benjamin to unmute. Hello, uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, I had a question about what you mentioned about the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, I think the phrase in the Sutta is something like establish mindfulness in front of you. And uh, <laughs> yeah. this phrase is a little enigmatic to me. Could you explain a bit more what is meant by establishing mindfulness in front? I think that just means, I think how I understand it, in front means, you know, in what's happening right now, <clears throat> in the present moment, you know, so, you know, when you're breathing in, you know that you're breathing in, when you're breathing out, you know that you're breathing out, and you are also aware of, you know, if there's some, some, what Vedana there is, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, the mind state so i think in front of you know there's also different people have translated it differently and but what it means is to just be with what's happening right now thank you mm -hmm. being in the present moment Hi, I can ask a, a follow-up question to what Minori was talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, because a couple of times when I've been concerned about things in the world, be it the environment or conflict and refugees and people being oppressed, and voiced a concern, 
about this and, and kind of question what can we do because you can feel so powerless uh, faced with that, that I've had a couple of responses from uh, other practitioners saying, well, you worry too much, stop worrying and meditate more. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about finding that balance between a concern for the world and the things in the world and, and a, a personal meditation practice. Mm -hmm. I, I think what, what is for me like most helpful is, you know, that I'm reflecting on, you know, the world cannot be fixed, you know, the world cannot be permanently fixed or samsara can't be fixed. But I'm still trying, you know, with all my might, what I can do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of, it's not like, you know, we can do things and we can do our best, but for that, we don't need to worry. Worry is, is extra, you know, and I think different people have like a different worrying comes from clinging, you know, from wanting things to be a, a particular way. And, and I think the most important thing is, is like doing the right thing, you know, and I think everybody has probably a bit of a different calling, you know, how they want, how they feel for them, it's the right way of, of living their calling, you know, one person might be on retreat, you know, and not, not go anywhere and benefit uh, the world in that way. And other people might go on the street, you know, and be in the front line of a, of a demonstration. So, I mean, there is no, you know, there is no one answer for everything, but everybody has to find out, you know, for themselves, what works for them. You know, I've, I've, I have uh, found, you know, what works for me, but that also, you know, um, affords me now that I need to leave from this place where I live now, you know, because I don't want to anymore live in a very reclusive way. I have done that for some time and now it's not right for me anymore, but that doesn't mean that now everybody has to go, you know, so there is not one answer, but I think, but what is true is, you know, that having the courage to look at one's own, you know, inner calling, because it might, you know, it might entail that you have to give up some of your privilege, you know, for example. And, and that's scary, you know. So, yeah, you know, it's to really, it's not like there is my meditation practice on the cushion and then there is my activist practice in the streets. It doesn't need to be like this, you know. It, I, but for that one needs a, a mature practice, you know. One can't probably do it from day one. But I think in the beginning, it might be like two things, you know, and then over time, it starts to merge and it starts to become one, you know. And then we know, you know, where our skills are really called for and where we can really make a difference. But that doesn't mean, you know, that you're going to fix it because it's unfixable. Samsara is unfixable. You know, and that's not the point because it's not about results it's about the process you know and that's what at the same time is our training environment for the mind you know so we can't really lose anything but it's important also you know not to bite more often one can chew and and that one can probably only learn by making mistakes also you know it's just part of it making making so-called mistakes you know because otherwise you don't you don't learn your boundaries you don't learn you know how much so that's part of it you know but always you know the whole thing contained within the noble eightfold path you can't go that wrong you know so it's not an it's not a simple answer yeah and indeed you know because one has to take responsibility for oneself you know and nobody can tell you what's the right thing for you to do but from hearing you know that you're working as a teacher with teenagers religion and philosophy i mean you know you are such a important person in the life of those people and you can open up so much for them so that's like 
you have you have already a, a great you're already having so such great livelihood you know so yeah thank you yeah i'll ask judith to unmute We can't hear you, Judith. You have to unmute you, yourself. I'm sorry. Hi. Now we, um, now thank we you so it. much. Thank you so much for your talk. I am um, in Washington State, just north of where you're located right now. Oh, yeah. And I am a beginner in the since the world, a word, and making mistakes right and left. Um, Finding community has been impossible for me locally. And yet um, that's something that I, I really want to do is find a community to connect with. I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm in an area where what little community there is is very far apart from, and I can't get to I can't get to a monastery um, and I don't know if it would be appropriate for me to do that. How do, does someone like me connect with community and contribute appropriately? There is so much going on in this community that I don't understand. And um, I hope I'm not wasting their time when I ask questions, but I really have a longing for community in, in a like-minded setting. And, and I'm also a, a creative as you are. Um, mm -hmm. But I think- I just know, like- um, Because are you living so remotely? I don't understand. Are you living in a town or where you live? I live in a town, but I live in a town that has um, two Buddhist communities one of which is completely um, oriented towards um, um, a very formal practice that is nothing like the forest tradition at all. And I do not drive and do not have access to transportation to so get that, there. I don't even know if I... Okay, I see. You know, that is very difficult if you don't have, if you don't drive and if you can't get places, yeah. Because then, you know, the only yeah. way how you can have communities online, isn't it? It seems to be, yes. Yeah, because if you can't drive and if there's no public transport, no buses or anything, then the, it's probably the only way, you know, or if you have a friend who can sometimes take you, but if you don't have that, there is not really much comes to mind, you know. But then at least, you know, there is a lot out there on the internet right now. So there is communities you can access in this way, just like the community here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you know, and thank Buddha you. And Buddhist monasteries or Buddhist communities are not the only communities. There are also other communities, you know, where you could maybe find, you know, uh, uh, some kinship. But of course, if you're, if you're practicing Buddhist meditation, you might want to do it with Buddhists. But if that is not available, there is also other communities maybe out there, you know. I was speaking specifically to the Buddhist tradition. Um, it's hard to find like-minded people and uh, to develop a practice in accord with, with um, the Dharma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, a, a lot yeah. of that. Yeah. Because it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes one needs to even, I mean, some people, and I did that too, you know, but I was younger then, you know, I changed the, where I lived, you know, in order to find community. Yeah. So, but you seem to be older, so that would be more difficult. Maybe, but not impossible. Right. But not right. impossible. 
but not impossible thing to do you know if if the yearning for community is that great then maybe that would be something to think about you know it is something i'm thinking about strongly but i think also when you're older i look older than i actually am right now i've had some health issues recently um when you're older, you don't even, you don't know whether you are welcome or not in a community because you tend to feel, or I tend to feel that, um, I, sorry, there's a horn in the background, um, that I would be a drain on the community because I'm older. I think that that is a viewpoint in the United States. It's very, very prevalent rather than what you can contribute um, to that community. And one of the reasons I enjoy art is because there is no age limit in art. When you no. are an artist, um, there's a different way of thinking. That and I do, a lot. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Please. But, you know, but yeah. older people also can uh, really bring in, you know, like exper life experience. So it's not on only a train, you know. Yeah, but I understand where you're coming from and, and I, you know, I wish you well that you will be guided, you know, to a way that you can uh, find a community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Judith. Thank you. And thank you for your talk. It was very, very helpful. Thank you so much. So maybe Kelly is, is slowly rebringing the session to an end, yeah? Yes, I think so. Thank you very much, Aya Santa Cheetah, for this evening's talk. It's been very inspiring and, and very helpful to me, and I'm sure for many of us here. Um, so I want to wish you all the very best for your future project, and, and thank you very much for offering this talk and, and answering our questions. So I wanted to say a few words about Dana. As always, this sort of discussion is offered Sorry, this uh, talk is offered on a donation basis. And if anyone would like to offer Dana, that would be very much appreciated. I've put the links to both the Loka Viharen and the Kampa Bikuni project in the chat box. Um, and I'd also like to mention that um, in November, after the retreat, there is a, a, a tour uh, with Ajahn Brahman, Venerable Chanda, and they will be giving talks in London, Oxford, Strad, Birmingham, and Bristol. And uh, also more information and tickets are available via the website. And I've put the link uh, for that in uh, the chat box as well. I'll just repost that again. So thank you very much. I will unmute everyone so we can say goodbye.